Hello, everybody. It's me, Fee, White Zulu. And I want to welcome you to another chapter of, well, yeah, another chapter of Okavango Diary. And I hope you're enjoying these readings. I want to welcome you all. And if you are enjoying them, please share or press the like button or whatever people do if they want to. I'm sorry, I'm a bit due on my car today. I haven't got any words in front of me to read, so I'm doing this off the cuff. However, this is a greeting to you all and a welcome, and I hope you, that you enjoy these um, chapters that I'm reading out. They go out twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays, if all goes well. And enjoy them. And thank you so much for listening to them. Share them around. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, everybody. It's me, Fee, Fiona Timms, or White Zulu. And I want to introduce you to another chapter from my diary, which I kept while running two luxury camps in the Okavango Delta, right in the heart of the Delta. So I decided it was such fun between the animals and the guests that I decided to keep a diary and I sent it back to my family and they loved them. I even sent it to a publisher, Kate Turkington, and she wanted to publish them. But unfortunately, things didn't turn out that way. <coughs> Excuse me. Because of my health. Anyway, this is chapter two of Okavango Diary, my flight from Maun to my first posting at Saro Camp. Siolo Farm. The farmhouse was a semi-derelict building out in the bush. It had once been quite a big roomy bungalow, but had been left to decay to a ruin by the previous owner, a Botswana government minister, who'd already earmarked it for a hunting lodge, but gone no further with any developments. The Safari Company, company which I worked for, had bought what was left of the building and property and was in the process of rebuilding it with the intention of turning the renovated Cape, uh, renovated accommodation into a luxury, luxury lodge. They had employ, employed a team of colored builders from Cape Town, brought them up in a truck along with necessary materials the necessary materials, and left them to get on with it. These were a motley crew of mixed-race scoundrels who had turned the job into one long drinking orgy. Unsupervised and hung over, they listlessly pushed a wheelbarrow of building materials around the site for a few hours in the mid-morning, then fell asleep for the hottest part of the day where it reached 50 degrees. In the late afternoon, they started drinking again and sang, swore and fought until they passed out in the early hours of the morning. Not surprisingly, the building work had never had had been going on for six months and had not yet reached window level. 
had the only habitable room in the house which she shared with her cat. I was given a bed in a tent under a huge fig tree on the grassy bank which sloped down to the Tamaka Lala, sorry, Tama Lakana River, Tamaklakana River. The murky brown waters slid smoothly through the property on its way to Maun and the rest of Botswana. I stowed my bag in the tent and then sat on the warm sand and watched in the fading light as three crocodiles glided past, swimming silently downstream on some sinister mission. Yvonne came down to join me, a glass of whiskey and water in her hand. Let's have supper, she said, and we walked back to the gutted kitchen, which consisted of a primus stove and a few tin trunks, trunks balanced on wooden sleepers and started hunting through one of the trunks. She finally located a single egg and some white bread with green spots on it. She also found a tin of sardines, which we shared. We were both tired and hungry and decided to go to bed before the generator shut down at nine o'clock. It was pitch dark in my tent but I found a torch standing next to the camp for bed light, camp bed for light. I got onto my, I got into bed and was Im immediately joined by Badger, the heartless Jack Russell Terrier, who curled up on my pino, pillow and began to root for fleas. I chucked him out. He came straight back in, as the tent had all kinds of gaps. I fell asleep until Badger, Badger barked loudly from my pillow next to my ear, making me levitate with fright. He didn't move or stand up, just barked intermittently through the night. I tapped him quite hard with a large, heavy, black, mag-like torch, which served as the bedside lamp. I settled down again, fell asleep, but was woken again, this time by a grinding noise. Rats were gnawing through the base of my mattress and upwards into my pillow. I called Badger back and said, Rats! Kill. He just looked at me and walked away. At first light, I was woken from a fitful doze by the cacophony of a flock of cake gloss, glossy starlings in the fig tree above my head. These gloriously coloured, iridescent, metallic turquoise birds were conducting a raucous dispute with a troop of vervet monkeys who also wanted access to the ripening figs. And their chattering and shrieking rang in my ears as they vied with the screeching birds. I looked around for Badger, feeling slightly guilty about banishing him from my tent last night. Perhaps a croc had got him in the night. Yvonne had told me that they liked to keep him away from the river, especially after dark, when those huge prehistoric reptiles preferred to hunt. But I saw him a little later on sniffing about in the debris left by the builders after their no noisy nocturnal reveling. Yvonne and I left for Maun Airport in a clapped-out old stallion pickup. It had no brakes, 
and was to held together with baling wire. To open the gate leaving the property, she had to slow down to allow me to hop out, open the gate while she drove through, and then jump back into the moving vehicle after the after closing the gate behind us. When I asked her what she did when she was on her own, she pointed to a large rock beside the gate and said, I put that against the wheel. Alpha Juliet Echo, a four-seater Cessna, was waiting for us on the strip. Yvonne tossed a mailbag to the pilot and leaving me and my bag next to the plane, tore off in a dust cloud to get to the office. I was joined by two gum-chewing Botswanas carrying all their luggage, consisting of some potatoes in a sack, an FM ghetto blaster, and other typically African odds and ends tied up in bright yellow plastic checkers, supermarket bags. This was in 1997. Martin, the pilot, muttered crossly as he hadn't been advised of these unexpected passengers and their cargo, started to load the tiny plane. We managed to stuff everything in eventually, and I climbed into the front co-pilot seat. The others sat at the back, and we took off for Kanaka, where we were to drop our two passengers, camp staff, coming home from their month's leave. The flight took about 20 minutes and was pleasant, low, and with a good view of elephants, giraffe and hippo from the air. We did a small detour from our approach to swoop down to tree height and drop the latest rugby score written on a piece of paper and tucked into an empty beer can, which Martin tossed into a bush camp simply because two of his mates had a bet on the a bet of a bottle of wine with him on the outcome. He cursed as the can landed in the swimming pool instead of on the lawn. And with a brief wing waggle, we soared back into the sky, banking so sharply that the treetops were just beneath my shoulder. I glanced backwards over at our two Botswana passengers. They were unperturbed by our sudden aerobatic manoeuvre, were still chewing placidly as a cow chews its cud, oblivious to our white people antics. I can remember Flying has been a part of my life. My father had acquired his pilot's license before the Second World War. And because we have uh, an airstrip on the farm itself and had, as a result, served in the South African Air Force as a bomber pilot flying Marylands over North Africa, Based in Egypt, he flew bombing raids on the Italians as they crossed the desert. After the war, he had returned to the ranch and cut an airstrip onto the plateau, a thousand feet above the valley in which the farmhouse nestled. He never went so far as to buy a plane, but some of our friends and the neighbouring ranches owned aircraft, mostly Cessna Cessna 150s, and used the strip occasionally. Once I'd reached the age of 16, and in spite of having failed my parents by being born a boy, 
I declared my intention of going to Oroby Flying School in Peter Maritzburg to pick up the necessary papers to apply for my pilot's license. The first requirement was a medical exam. On my reporting to the school sanatorium, the doctor started the exam by asking me to read an eye chart. I could read only the top two lines and cursorily he broke the news. It was no point in continuing. I had failed the basic eye test and would not be accepted to any flying school. Crushed with disappointment, I returned to my classroom. My dreams were shattered. I would never be allowed to pilot an aircraft. I had a pair of prescription glasses made up to correct my myopia, which dramatically improved my ability to read the blackboard at school, but I didn't care about schoolwork anyway. I had fixed my sights on being a pilot. This Esna, built in the late 1950s and the most popular small plane among ranches in South Africa, Australia and the USA, the little Two-seater Cessna 150 with its 125 horsepower single-prop engine was nicknamed the Volkswagen Beetle of the Skies, and indeed the tiny cramped cockpit with so little legroom that even a medium-sized person had to suck in his stomach and tuck his knees beneath his ears in order to operate the controls, especially on takeoff or during steep climbs, that created the similarity to the Falksy interior. But it was the aerobatic ca capability and forgiving nature of the Cessna 150 which made it the most prolific and successful light aircraft. It was a common joke that farmers bought it simply because the, the strut-based high wing allowed them to taxi through gates and up to their doorsteps, saving them the effort of having to get out and walk the last few yards. Both camps were accessible only by light aircraft in the dry season. There was a short space of time when all the heavy goods such as diesel fuel, canned and dry goods and other non-perishable commodities could be sent up to the camps in an ancient and temperamental Bedford lor army lorry. So, predictably, it was that little workhorse of the skies, the Cessna, that performed all the necessary duties needed to supply and staff the camps. Once I'd settled into my job at Saro, I met a cheerful young Australian bush pilot called John, who allowed me to fly while he pursued his hobby of photographing game. He would hang out of the open window with his camera while I circled elephant, giraffe and other animals. He was the one who taught me how to drop the nose of the Cessna on approaching, approaching big birds like marabou storks and martial eagles because those birds, when startled, always fly upwards, whereas the all the many species of vultures suddenly drop height on approach. I had also learned to buzz low and noisily with lots of wing waggle in order to chase off grazing animals 
such as antelope and buffalo, which preferred the short grass of their mown camp strips. Buffalo are notoriously bad-tempered creatures and would simply raise their heads and shake their horns at the fragile Cessna before resuming their interrupted dinner. That's when John would grab a beer can from under his seat and kept for that purpose, as well as urgent calls of nature, leant out of the cockpit window and with a hard yell, and with a yell, hurl it full or empty at the rump of the offending beast, which would bellow in rage and trot furiously off into the bush, searching for his assailant. Most importantly, I learned from John always to put the specially made metal cages over the plane wheels and lock them carefully if we were leaving the plane out overnight. Many a bush pilot had woken up early in order to fly out of camp, fly guests out of camp, only to find the rubber wheels completely eaten away by hyenas. We could only speculate that the hyenas enjoyed the sensation of chewing up rubber, as they would also eat rubber dustbins, trainers, and even binoculars if one was careless enough to leave such items outside at night. It was more than inconvenient and expensive to have to radio base in Maun and ask for three new wheels to be flown up from Maun before one could start the day's work. By then I had 20-20 vision thanks to state-of-the-art contact lenses and could fulfill my dreams of flying on a daily basis, unhindered by any form of regulation or air traffic, as we were the only human occupants of the skies over that vast piece of Africa. Whenever I fly now, I'm reminded of John McGee's poem, which starts, Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and dance the skies on laughter silvered wings sunward i've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun split clouds and done a thousand things you have not dreamt of hello everybody Thank you so much for listening to my videos and my stories of my life. And I want to thank John Moslane for being what I call the sound engineer, but I'm sure there's a more professional word for it. However, faithful, and for four years now, I think, he has been here for me every Wednesday well, I I think it's Wednesdays, but once a week to record two chapters of whichever book it is I'm reading. And without him, this couldn't be done. So a big thank you to John. Also, Sean van Furen, we send the videos to them, him. Sorry, I'm not reading this. I'm just doing it off the cuff. And my brain is a bit tumor car. And Sean uploads them to the YouTube channel where you can find them all in playlists. He does it beautifully. And I want to thank them both for all the help that they give me. Well, it's not help. They do everything for me. And it's it's a great asset. So also, I have a website called whitezulubook.com obviously www in front of it, but you'll find it there quite easy to find. 
Johnny Clegg's called the White Zulu. Mine's called White Zulu. And you will find on my website, you'll find all kinds of photographs going way back to when my ancestors settled in the Cape 1652. Well, not photographs of them, but descriptions, uh, this photograph of my grandmother's wedding and lovely, lovely photos of the farm we still own. My sister sent me a photograph this morning of the farm in midsummer, and she says how beautiful it's looking. I've had a lot of rain. So, just want to thank my helpers, John and Sean, to thank you all for listening. And also, please share this with everybody else. Hit the like button and enjoy. Goodbye.